This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty. Welcome to episode 24 of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes, and this week we have Jay Crawford joining us. Jay, of course, formerly of ESPN, where he hosted Cold Pizza and First Take. He anchored Sports Centers. Now he's an anchor for WKYC in Cleveland, where he also co-hosts the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Jay, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, you, you have a you obviously have a really cool resume that I, I absolutely want to dive into, but is it true that you also have or at least had a low 90s fastball? <laughs> Once upon a time, yes. Uh, are, are you the person that added that to your Wikipedia page? No, I don't know who did that. <laughs> I, w I think the way it got added was we did a story once when I, um, when I was with ESPN and Jim Bowden, who was at the time the general manager of the Washington Nationals, he had previously been one of our baseball analysts, so he and I became friendly. And he knew that I pitched in a bunch of amateur leagues and had thrown some minor league games. So he invited me to spring training one year to throw a simulated game against, against the Nationals. Oh, wow. And so we obviously took a camera and we did a story on it. And while I was pitching, the cameraman for ESPN got behind the radar gun and you could see the number on the foreground and me pitching in the background. And somebody, you know how Wikipedia is, yeah. I, you don't know how it happens or what, but somebody had uh, had seen that um, what my mile per hour was and they added it to the page uh, from there. But, you know, it, 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 that's kind of, <laughs> it's not exactly a rock solid source, but um, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's how that got added yeah. to the page. When when did you play minor <laughs> league baseball? How, how far did your baseball um, playing career go? Well, What's funny is I didn't I didn't pitch professionally until later in life. Um, I played baseball my whole life. Uh, wanted to play in college at Bowling Green. I had a pretty severe knee injury, which now would be kind of routine and run of the mill my senior year after my senior year of high school. And um, when I got to school, I knew right away that I wasn't going to be able to uh, try to play baseball at Bowling Green. So I really threw myself into the uh, radio, television, film program. And I really stopped playing baseball um, until my mid to late 20s. I started playing in some amateur leagues in Tampa, Florida, and found that uh, I had, you know, I, would, I was always a pitcher, but I, in high school, I played center field and shortstop, and that's what I wanted to do in college. But um, just, you know, my body had transformed um, quite a bit from the time I was 19 years old to the time I was 27 when I started playing again. And my fastball had a whole lot more life on it. I still had really good control, and I added a couple pitches. So I had some success in the, uh, in the amateur leagues in Tampa. And then when I went to ESPN, um, Bill Vex, I think it was his grandson. He was the general manager of the Rays. And I had worked in Tampa, so we kind of knew each other from that. But he had written a book that he was plugging on ESPN. He came to New York um, to do cold pizza and plug the book. And he said, hey, are you still throwing? Um, and I said, yeah, I am. And he goes, are you still any good? And I said, well, here's, here's my website. You know, it's got all the stats up. You can go take a look. He goes, you know what? I will. Well, he at the time owned the St. Saint Paul Saints. So after his appearance – he went and looked at my website. And at the time I was like seven and one with a 1.1 ERA or something insane like that. So he um, asked if I would be interested in coming to pitch some for the St. Saint Paul saints. And I said, yeah, you don't have to twist my arm. So I did, I can't baseball reference has the years. Oh really? Um, yeah. I, I want to say, I think I was 39 years old Wow. by this point. Um, so I, it was probably 2005, maybe 2004, 2005. I pitched a couple games for St. Paul. And then I, I think either later that year or maybe the next year, um, I flew out to California and pitched a game for Long Beach, which was my last game. And I was only supposed to pitch an inning. 
But there was a weird communication snafu, and there were some major league scouts coming to look at a pitcher who had previously pitched for the Detroit Tigers who was pitching for Long Beach as well. They thought he was going to get the start on Friday, but it ended up where he wasn't supposed to get the start till Saturday, but all the scouts had come to the game to scout him on that Friday. So when I take the mound, they're like, who the hell is this guy? And where is this former Tigers pitcher that's trying to make a comeback? So they told me like 45 minutes. I was in the bullpen getting loose. They told me 45 minutes before, look, we'd hoped to pitch you maybe five or six innings, but we've got scouts that are here to look at so-and-so. And we're going to have to, um, we're only going to give you an inning. And I'm like, well, that sucks. You know, I flew all the way from California to Connecticut, from Connecticut to California. I threw an inning and I had a one, two, three inning. And I struck out a former first round draft pick of the angels who later retired that year. And he said, I knew it was time for me to retire when a cold pizza host struck me out. So because I had gone one, two, three in the, in the first inning, I came out and their manager and pitching coach were there and they're like, wow. Man, I can't take you out now. You just threw, you know, a really nice inning. We'll give you one more inning. So they gave me one more inning and I didn't give up a hit. So I'm probably the only pitcher in the history of minor league baseball where his last appearance before complete retirement was a two inning no hitter. <laughs> and I was pulled after my second inning. So it's a shame. I'll never know exactly how it could have turned out if I'd if I had stayed in there and kept going, but uh, I didn't get the chance, but no, no hard feelings. Uh, it was always my dream when I was a kid to be a professional baseball player. And when I was done a broadcaster, I just did it in reverse order. I was a broadcaster and then a professional baseball player and had been lucky enough to go back to broadcasting. So it's a weird story. Did you, was it being that you were 39 or so, was it like a, a, a Jim Morris Dennis Quaid in the rookie type situation? Like, um, did you, was, were there, was there ever a point where you thought about playing a full season even in the minor leagues or at that point, or were you too far into your TV career to do something like that? Yeah. If it had come many years earlier, I would have. Um, but, uh, I, it was never a thought for me to leave TV. I mean, is I, I love doing it. It certainly provided, um, a, a much more lucrative career than minor league baseball. But I'm really glad I got to do it. I'm, I've met a lot of friends and a lot of teammates on those two teams that I, I still keep in contact. It was funny. The third baseman for the St. Saint Paul Saints when I was there is a guy named Chad Ernstberger. Played at Ohio State when Nick Swisher was there. In fact, was actually a better college player than Nick. He was drafted. He's, he's an Ohio kid. He and I be, have become good friends. But when he was there um, is, is when we met. And fast forward probably... 10 years, I would say. I was playing in a 25 and up league in Connecticut and our team had made it to the championship round and he actually came from Ohio to Connecticut to watch me pitch in this championship game, which was kind of funny because we met, you know, when when he was a third baseman for the St. Paul Saints. So, um, you know, I, I picked up a couple of lifelong friends along the way and the experiences and the videotape that I was able to get because the Saints games were televised and we had an ESPN crew that was at the uh, Long Beach game out in California. So, you know, I mean, it's really cool. I've got that tape, um, you know, years from now when I'm teaching my grandson how to pitch, I'll be able to pop that tape in and say, hey, you know what? Once upon a time, <laughs> your old grandpa wasn't half bad. So yeah, no, that's, that's kind of cool. Def definitely a really cool experience to have. Um, For sure. I guess for uh, for a lack of a better transition, let's move to the the part of your career that fits the awful announcing audience a little more than minor league baseball. But um, <laughs> right. you were so you were laid off from ESPN in 2017 and eventually made your way back to local television in Cleveland. And I, I think from right. the from the outside going from national to local looks kind of like a, a downgrade. Um but that has to be different when that local is your hometown. So I guess, how would you categorize that move going from ESPN and then eventually getting back to Cleveland? So when I started my TV career, my dad was big on goals. He always used to say, write down goals, short term, and that's within the next year, midterm, 
now to five years and long-term, like long-term five years and out and what you want to do for good. And he made me do that before I went off to Bowling Green. And um, I had some short-term was to go to college, get an education, gain some experience in media, either radio or television. Uh, Midterm was to graduate and to break into television and have a career in TV. And my long-term goals were always get a job in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it's where I'm from. I never had ESPN ambitions. Even like when I first got into the business, ESPN was kind of fledgling and they were just getting their feet. And, you know, if you turn them on, you were watching truck pulls and stuff like that. You know, this was way before they got into the NFL business. Um, and then as my career progressed, it was just really weird how it unfolded. I was, every move I made was to position myself to get to Cleveland. And when I got a job in Hartford, Connecticut, it was really the first time that I was in a market that had pro sports because they had the Whalers then. And I was between Boston and New York. So I was going to both of those cities a lot to cover major league sports. So I felt like I was sort of getting my feet wet and getting some experience in that. And I thought I can get to Cleveland from Hartford because at the time Hartford was like the 23rd market. Cleveland was the 10th. And I figured that's a good next step. That's a good progression. And I was like 26 years old. 27 years old when I started in Connecticut. Um, and then uh, a weird thing happened. Instead of going to Cleveland, I got a job in Columbus and it was the number one station in Columbus and it was a great station. There was just nothing happening in Cleveland because the jobs were held by guys that were extremely entrenched in the market. So I knew that breaking in in Cleveland was going to be very difficult. So I did five years in Columbus and I thought for sure, I mean, I'm, you know, two hours south of Cleveland. I, I covered all of the Indians playoff games from 93 to 98. I was up in Cleveland covering Browns. Uh, I, I covered Ohio State football. I went to every Buckeye game during the five-year stretch, including a Rose Bowl win. But even after five years in Columbus, there was still nothing happening in Cleveland. So I got an offer in Tampa. So, you know, I kicked it around and I thought, God, I could sit here in Columbus for 10 years before something opens in Cleveland. So let me change things up a little bit and go to Tampa. And I loved the weather down there. It was fantastic. I did five years there. Still nothing opening in Cleveland. Like these main jobs, the guy that's at number one sports guy at NBC Cleveland, where I am now, was there when I was in college. Oh, wow. <clears throat> you know, his name's Jim Donovan. He's the voice of the Browns. He's the best local sports anchor I've ever seen. He's a guy that I patterned my style after. He's very conversational. I would watch him and I would just feel like he was just talking directly to me and only to me. He's so good. Um, but when nothing opened and ESPN called, I thought, well, I'll go do a contract at ESPN. And certainly after five years at ESPN, something will open in Cleveland. And now I'll have a little bit of a national brand. That'll be an easy jump for me to make. But, you know, life happens. My kids were going to first high school and then college in the Northeast. And because we had moved them from their beloved Florida up to New York, they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want us to pick up and move and go to Cleveland. So, you know, one contract became two, became three, became four, and then ultimately five contracts. And that was, you know, 17 years there was never part of the plan ever. Yeah. I literally thought five years, get to Cleveland, call it a day and just retire from here. Um, and, but you know, weird things happen. Um, you know, I just kept signing and re-signing and re-signing. And then I caught wind shortly after I had just signed a four-year contract, which was, I really almost didn't sign because I didn't want to tie myself. And at this point, my son was almost done at Rutgers and he was a track and field athlete there and, and nationally ranked and finished as the, you know, the NCAA runner up the year before and was the overwhelming favorite to win the NCAA championship the next year. I really didn't know, do I want to move away and miss all of that, which was mostly centered in the Northeast, but, and, and that job and gave me the flexibility to be able to travel to all of his meets. Right. So I, I reluctantly resigned. And then shortly after I resigned, I caught wind that they were looking to buy out 125 on-air personalities. And the way that would work was they would pay us as if we were still going to work every day for the bulk, for the entirety of our contract, including, including our, 
our scheduled raises at, at, after every year, all of our 401k um, uh, contributions, all of your insurances and everything. And in my case, I had three years left on my contract. And they said, the only thing that will change for you is you won't have to go to work. And so I caught wind of that. I thought, that's a pretty damn good plan. I can move to Cleveland and position myself for my job when I can finally go back to work. Because they were paying me, I couldn't take a job anywhere else. Sure. So, um, again, I caught wind of that. And I'm at this point now, I'm rooting for that. I'm like, you know, buy me out, please. So all in one fell swoop, they bought out a whole bunch of us that had a lot of years and a lot of money left on our contract because they were basically looking for a tax write-off. They had made so much money in other divisions that year, particularly their movie division, that they had to show losses somewhere to sort of counterbalance their tax re responsibility. Yep. And it was us. So they bought out a whole bunch of us. And we had the really odd situation situation of staying home from our jobs for in some cases i think someone told me andy katz had like seven years left on a contract he had just signed an eight-year contract wow they also paid him so i called it my practice retirement you know i golfed every day we traveled we did whatever we wanted to do and after i hadn't gone to work for almost a year i got a huge raise and then I didn't go to work for another year and I got another huge raise. It was kind of like a winning lottery ticket. All that being said, I was bored to tears. Yeah. I that wanted was, that was going to be the next I, question. I, yeah. I'm way, I was way too young at the time. I was in my early fifties. Now I'm 58. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll move to Cleveland, which I did. And in the interim, the ESPN did let me do, Browns preseason games. So I got to be the TV voice of the Browns preseason for a couple of years. Um, and I did some things for the Patriots as well. And I did some other freelance stuff that was just one-offs. ESPN wouldn't let me take a job, but they did let me do some things just to keep busy, uh, which was nice. It was a lifesaver because I was going out of my head. But in the process, I was able to move home and start thinking about my next chapter. So I started immediately. Um, I was in conversations with two of the local television stations here to just try to figure out what I wanted to do at the station and what I wanted to do there moving forward. And in no time I came up, uh, I came up to an agreement with an agreement with the NBC station. The only thing was I had to wait for my ESPN contract to expire. And literally the day after it expired, I went to work at NBC Cleveland finally. Uh, and so my weird route to my ultimate destination took 15 to 20 years longer than it should have. But at the end, I'm finally where I wanted to be all along. I like being a fan. I like going to games that I care about, rooting for teams that I want to win, and being a fan again. Because for all the years I was at ESPN, it sort of washes the fan out of you. So now I feel like I'm where, I have to, where I'm supposed to be. I know I'll be here for at least three more years. And then after that, we'll play it by ear. If I'm still having fun and want to be in the North year round, then I'll continue. But, you know, I may want to be in the South for six months and here for six months. So, you know, we'll just sort of reassess it in three years and take inventory then and decide what happens next. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've always paid attention to Adam the bull um, and, and kind of followed his career that, that voice caught my ear the, the first time I heard him on <laughs> WFAN years ago. And I just, I thought he was a, a really good radio host. And about a year and a half ago, I think it was a year and a half ago or so when I saw that he was leaving 92, three, the fan for uh, a local YouTube show, I was, I was like, I, I thought that was an odd career move at first. And a lot of people like, did. Yeah. Like I, I, I love radio radio is that's my favorite medium. Um, but like now the, the more that I see the direction the radio industry is moving versus the growth of digital and YouTube shows, I, I certainly I understand the move more. But when you were pitched this opportunity, what made you confident that there was an audience for um, a local sports show on YouTube? Well, I've been watching. I've been paying attention and I'm seeing where the audience has shifted to. And it's shifting away from linear TV. It's shifting away from radio at about the same speed that the industry shifted away from newspaper 20 years ago. 
you know, with the advent of digital and the internet and information instantly at your fingertips from a billion different sources, it's fractured the financial structure and the old model um, into a million pieces. And obviously, you know, when it was first pitched to me, I said, no, I'm not interested in that. Not because it was a YouTube show, um, because I didn't really want to do a two hour daily along with a one hour daily live show on channel three. So initially it didn't really interest me. And I'd said, you know, I think I'm going to pass. Uh, but then I corporate had a corporate sort of put out there what, the, what their goal here is. So I work for a company called Tegna. They own yeah. 62 local television stations across the country. And with those 62 stations, they have a very, very big penetration of the ent entire United States. They have big stations in big markets. And when it was pitched to me, their, their, their entire pitch was, our vision is to have an ultimate sports show network. So you have an ultimate Cleveland sports show. They've just launched the ultimate Dallas sports show. They're going to do an ultimate Denver, an ultimate Minneapolis, an ultimate Seattle. What they've what what's happened with sports coverage is the ESPN's model is old and broken. It's it's tired. It's old. The information sh those information shows I don't even know how they're hanging on because we get our information. We're the executive producers of our feeds. We decide what we get notifications for. I'm told in real time when all of my teams score or there's a lead change in any of my team's games. We no longer have to be slaves to the box to watch the whole game or to, God forbid, in the old days, we used to have to stay up for the late sports center to see what happened. Like, no, dead. It, it doesn't have to work that way anymore. So what's happened is, and really what they found – the reason this idea came about is because Tegna purchased a company called Locked On. And they're a podcasting company that did Locked On Cleveland, Locked On Detroit, Locked On yep. San Francisco, Locked On Philadelphia. They've got maximum penetration of the entire country. And they're, they're narrow casting to that city's fan base. And in, a, in, in the case of Cleveland, um, within the last, if you count Sunday's postgame show, Monday's 11 to 1 live show and today or yesterday's 11 to 1 live show, we've re we reach over 100,000 people in, in those three days. And the response and the growth of this has been astounding. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that we could reach that kind of audience. What's happened is we've, in a very short period of time, built a brand that's reliable to Cleveland sports fans. And we've become a go-to source for information. The local television stations have three minutes at 6 and 11. ESPN doesn't waste time with Cleveland stories unless they're major stories. And oftentimes they're bad news. Right. So what we've sort of found is we've filled the niche that's when the, we, we said, like, imagine this. We send notifications to our 30,000 plus subscribers Anytime we're going to go live with breaking news. So let's just say Deshaun Watson practiced today. And after practice, he said, uh, I feel like my shoulder is worse. They did an MRI. It's a torn rotator cuff. We immediately scramble up and get a couple of hosts on the air from home, wherever we are. And all of our subscribers get an instant notification to their phone. UCSS is live right now with instant reaction to the Deshaun Watson news. It's the, the landscape has changed so dramatically in the almost 40 years now that I've been in the business that this is the future. And um, you're going to see that more and more. I, I read not long ago that Bob Iger, in his address to Disney shareholders, said that in the not too distant future, he sees ESPN as a stream only service. And think about it. Why are they programming 48 hours a day between ESPN and ESPN2? They're programming and filling 48 hours a day. When in reality, the only thing that moves the meters now is live sports. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. So you don't need the infrastructure of this massive campus in Bristol and all of that overhead. We've built a network with four on-air personalities and a studio that is equipped with professional equipment. But 
We'll take our phones and go live from wherever we are, whenever we want. And we don't need a network to do that. So that's the future. Um, and I don't intend to do this for long, but it's exciting to be kind of on the front edge because remember, I was the first host of Cold Pizza, which became First Take, which is still on the air and still doing very well. I do think there's room and space for the opinion shows, but you got to give me something that I can't get anywhere else. And that's what First Take does with Stephen A and his banter. And other than that, like I watched, the, I haven't seen a sports center since I don't even know. I don't even know how long it's been. Certainly in the time that I've, since I've gone, because right. I just don't need that. I get everything they're telling me. I get it right on my phone. Yeah, no, there's, there's not a, uh, for me at least, there's there's certainly not a need to tune into Sports Center if it's on. It's because it was something that just kind of it, it came on after I was watching something else, or it's just right. habitual to turn ESPN on at this point, or it's on at a at a, a bar or an airport or something like that. But the, that's uh, it. In terms of Sports Center being appointment television, that's just not not the case anymore. No, um, it's not. And I think they're aware of that. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, look, they you, you see since I've been bur was bought out of my contract there have been three different waves of layoffs right. <clears throat> and there's more to come and i'm told from people that are inside the building that what they're doing is as uh, talent contracts come up they're just not renewing them yeah and they're just going to let one by one is going to slip away and walk out that's why i'm thankful for the timing of mine i was able to get out before there were a million people looking for whatever jobs are available out there on the local level. And I knew right. where I wanted to go and my brand was always Cleveland anyhow. So that was really a no brainer for me, but I worry about some of the guys that are still there and what they're going to do when they're let go. Because obviously at that pay scale, which has come way down, but they're still paid well, it's going to be very hard for all of them to find landing spots because they're all going to be looking for landing spots at once. And there's not a lot of landing spots left. Yeah. Um, how was the the dynamic of, of covering the Deshaun Watson trade? Like the the balance of recognizing that the team was getting a franchise, uh, potentially a franchise quarterback, while also still not ignoring the fact that part of the reason why the Browns were getting him was because he was accused of sexual misconduct by dozens of women. So like having to deal with that that balance, how was covering that? Yeah, it was it was unlike anything I had done in my career. Um, it was just such a, such a weird time because you have to remember at the time of the trade, they were only two years removed, not even from Baker Mayfield turning this franchise from a perennial loser to a playoff team that won a playoff game at Pittsburgh and damn near came within a fourth down con conversion of beating Kansas City in Kansas City to go to the AFC Championship game. And then in a matter of nine months, that whole thing was blown up. Yeah. And if you would have told me after the Browns loss at Kansas City that Baker Mayfield's on borrowed time in Cleveland, I never would have believed it. I just, I, I wouldn't have believed it because it was it, where the team had been the previous 30 years and where he had taken them in a short period of time you just felt like, wow, we finally got not just the coach right, but we got the coach and the quarterback right. And then all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, a number of things happen. Baker Mayfield injures his shoulder a couple of games into the next season. He should have tapped out and said, no, I can't play. Even though this is my non-throwing shoulder, it's still too painful. I can't throw the ball with the same accuracy. He should have been the adult in the room and tapped out. He wasn't. Nobody in the Browns organization was adult enough to say, Baker, you're clearly not the same guy. You could, we saw it with our eyes in real time. Something's wrong. He played, he played. Now, obviously, he was playing for a contract. He was in the last year of a contract, uh, <clears throat> his rookie contract, and he was playing for another deal. So, And then the weird stuff with OBJ happened where his dad puts out a videotape of the All-22 showing right. that, Odell's open all the time and Baker doesn't throw to him. And weirdly, the Browns were much better from a production and a winning standpoint in games where Odell didn't play compared to games when he did. And in very short order, I think that was the tipping point. 
fans saw that tape that Odell's dad put out, and suddenly Baker became persona non grata. He was the problem. So I think a large portion of the fan base had moved on. They were the vocal part of the fan base. And then came the weird discussions about they weren't going to re-sign Baker Mayfield. And then came the news that, you know, Baker found out through the media that they were that they were pursuing Deshaun Watson. And the next day, the story comes out that Watson told the Browns, no, he doesn't want to play in Cleveland. Then the Browns came back to Baker. Now Baker's holding the hammer. And Baker said, No, I want, I don't want, I can't play for you guys. You were ready to move on yesterday. And now your new date to the prom said no. And now you want to go to the prom with me? I'm good. And so from there, it just evolved or devolved into this situation where he's gone. The Browns come back with the richest contract offer in guaranteed dollars in the history of the sport for a guy who was already in the spotlight for a sexual assault scandal with, as you said, dozens of women. And I just said, well, this is like, th- I didn't have this on my Browns bingo card, but I should have. Like, this is the stuff that happens to the Browns. And I thought that a lot of people were quick to judge Deshaun Watson as an abuser. Um, I'm still not sure myself what to believe. There were so many women, but at the same time, I understand that you know there were there was money to be made, and the lawyer representing the women was actively reaching out. Hey, anybody else want to jump on this train? And the next thing you know, there's 25 or whatever the number ended up growing to, and it was just watching it in real time was unbelievable. And then he comes back last year after his 11 game suspension and never even remotely looked like the guy that was in the MVP conversation a couple of years early, earlier. Right. And even this year in three games, his first two games were stinkers. Like he did not play well at all. And then he finally comes out against Tennessee and looks kind of like that guy. And everybody's excited. Here he is. He's back. And then the injury, and he's missed the last two games, and we still don't know if he's going to play Sunday against Indianapolis. So it's one of the more bizarre storylines I've ever covered up close. And personally, I'm not convinced yet that that deal had to be made. I'm not sure Kevin Stefanski was sure it had to be made because in the days after it was made, he was asked at a news conference what his role in was in the recruitment. And he said, look, you know, I think someone asked him pointedly, did you think that you had to move on from Baker? And he said, no, I thought we could win with Baker. We did win with Baker. Um, I thought that was perfectly fine, but we had an opportunity to upgrade the position because I think everybody in in that time and even now would say it was an upgrade. So, you know, here we are now in the second year of a five-year guaranteed deal, and we're handcuffed with one another for better or worse. So I don't know how this thing ends. My hope is he gets healthy, he balls out, and with this really, really good defense, he doesn't have to be old Houston Deshaun for them to make the playoffs and make a run. He can just be adequate Deshaun. Don't give the ball away. Take care of the football. Be the Ravens. Be the Buccaneers. You know, when they won Super Bowls with all-time elite defenses and Trent Dilfer and Brad Johnson. Just, we may not need you to be all-time great. We're just going to need you to be pretty good. And hopefully he comes back and he can do that and the Browns can make a run and see what happens. How does the Cleveland sports fan feel about Watson right now? Like, is is there still optimism, or does it just feel like this contract is is destined to be a bust at this point? Brandon, that's a great question, and I always hate trying to characterize a fan base's emotions because, as you know, it's way more complex than that. There are pockets of fans that will staunchly defend him no matter what, and they will stand by their guns that this was a move that had to be made. Then there are fans that never wanted him here. They're never going to accept him short of winning a Super Bowl because very few trades in NFL history are judged by winning a Super Bowl. It's a success. If you never win a Super Bowl, it's a failure. This trade, because of the equity they had to give up, three first-round draft picks, his cap hit next year is going to be $64 million. So it's an all-in move. It's not a, let's see if we can make the playoffs. We made the playoffs with number six. 
we've got to win multiple playoff games, get to a Super Bowl, and bring it home. Otherwise, what did we do this for? What you know? Why did we give up three first round draft picks? We we still don't have a first round pick next year, and you know that can set an organization back five, ten years. And we've missed on a big number of draft picks that we have had. You know, we drafted Anthony Schwartz as a receiver a couple of years ago. We drafted David Bell as a receiver in the third round also a couple of years ago. Schwartz is gone. Bell is on life support. And we drafted Cedric Tillman with a third round pick last year. And you can't find him with magnifying glass in Cleveland. Like he's just been, where is he? And so it's just, it's going to be a deal that is judged very simply. It will be a success if they win a Super Bowl. And short of that, it's a fail. And uh, that puts a lot of pressure on Deshaun Watson to bring it home. And I hope he can. Um, but this regime will not be remembered well, and they'll be judged very harshly if they come up woefully short. Last year, obviously, unacceptable. You know, you, you've got to win more than seven games if you're going to, you know, try to <laughs> make the postseason party. And this year through five, they're three and two. They're coming off a huge win over San Francisco. It looks like the pieces are there on defense, but with Nick Chubb out on offense and a big question mark still at quarterback, this wide receiver room has one touchdown through five games. Now that's not how you get to the playoffs. So yeah. Deshaun <laughs> has to come back. He has to be healthy. He has to play well. And if all of those things happen, we could be talking about a, a deep playoff run. Other than that, I don't see it. Um, throughout your time on ESPN, you you never hid your Cleveland fandom. Cleveland was was always a, a big part of your persona, even as a national sportscaster. As a Cleveland sports fan and a prominent ESPN personality at the time, what was it like watching the decision? Really tough. I'm not going to lie. Um, I had all my eggs in the basket that he was going to stay home. You know, home is a special home is, you know, where are you from, Brandon? I'm from uh, Long Island, New York. <clears throat> okay. So that that's always going to be a special place for you. And I don't know if you live there now, but if you don't and you have an opportunity to go back, I'm guessing you're going to want to go back. It's home, family, friends, familiarity, sports teams that you care about. Like, I, all I ever wanted to do in my career was get back to Cleveland. So for me, I'm looking at LeBron, who is from Northeast Ohio, played there uh, right out of high school. It was the only home he ever know, had ever known. I just thought, of course, he's an Ohio kid. Ohio kids, when they can, stay home. So when he went on TV to break up with us, that was tough, man. That was tough. Um, but fast forward a couple of years, when he is a free agent again, and now he's got two titles to his legacy, so he's obviously checked those boxes that in order to be considered an all-time great, you have to check. Um, when, it, when it was up in the air as to where he was going to go, um, of course, everybody in Bristol said, oh, he's going to go to New York uh, because the Knicks were heavily involved in trying to bring him back or bring him there. But even then, I said, no, he's going to come home. He was an Ohio kid who left, and like most Ohio kids I know, like myself, when we leave, we, we got one thing on our mind. How do we get back? And I, I was very confident that he was going to come back. I think probably one of the highlights of my career was being able to be on air and be the one that announced to the right. national audience that he was coming home. I just thought, that how appropriate. Me, Chris Broussard, um, who else was on the set? Mark Windhorst Stein was Brian and Brian Windhorst Windhorst. And, you know, three of the four guys had Ohio ties. Uh, Brew played college basketball in Ohio. Windhorse obviously covered LeBron when he was in high school, I think for the Akron Beacon Journal. And then later, you know, he was went to ESPN as kind yep. of a LeBron reporter. So it was funny. We were doing a segment on SportsCenter talking about what he's going to do. It was July 11th. We knew that a decision had to be coming soon. We go to commercial break. My producer gets in my ear and says, are you ready for this? And I said, yeah. He said, he's coming home. And that was it. Like, it was total euphoria for me, for the other guys on the set that were rooting for him to come home. And um, we said, we're coming out of the commercial break. Jay, 
perfectly fitting that you get to tell America that LeBron James is coming home because you know it wasn't out yet. All that all that happened was uh, I think Curry wrote the letter and they put it out on Sports Illustrated or however they were disseminating it. But within seconds, we were reporting on it on Sports Center. So even though we didn't break the story, we yeah. were the ones that were delivering the news to the masses. Sure. And we stayed on and did live coverage for a couple of hours. And it was one of the truly amazing experiences. And I had many of them during my time at ESPN. I was so blessed to, to get to do and cover the things I did. But that was, for me, the highlight. And it sort of took away uh, the pain of him leaving. And then, obviously, him finishing the deal and winning a title before he left again. Um kind of made it all worthwhile because like the Watson deal, it's a failure if he comes home and they don't win another one. Cause now he's truly right. in the prime of his career and he knows what it takes to win. Um, and, but they came dangerously close to not getting that being down three, one and 16 to the warriors, but uh, being in Cleveland when they clinched game seven, um, being right there in the plaza between Progressive uh, Field, where the got now Guardians play, and Rocket Mortgage Field House, where the Cavs play. There was that place was packed because there was a live audience watching it on the jumbotron inside, and there were thousands of fans out in the plaza between the two stadiums. It's a night I'll never forget, and as long as I live. So, um, you know, that was definitely one of the highlights of my time there. How was then working with the the, the person who? sort of branded himself into the the foremost LeBron James hater in sports media for nine years. And <laughs> of course I'm referring to Skip Bayless there. Yeah. I have nothing but um, fond memories um, and friendship with Skip. I, I never saw eye to eye on a lot of his sports opinions, um, but I appreciated the passion and the energy he poured into each and every debate topic that we discussed during our nine or 10 years together. Um, nobody prepares more or harder than Skip does. Um, he is absolutely committed to his craft. In his heart, he believes he's telling us what we don't, what, what, what we have to know, but we don't already. Um, so, you know, it was fun to be alongside of skip for the start. Cause he wasn't there for the start of cold pizza. When cold pizza right. launched, it was more of a variety kind of good morning America with sports. We added the debate portion about a year in because there was no real hardcore meat and potato sports conversations in that format. So we added skip page and Woody Bay, uh, skip, uh, uh, skip, skip Bayless and Woody page, Bayless yeah. and Woody page to the daily rotation and that's when the show really started to take off. So to be alongside Skip for that entire journey from when we were a fledgling, sh this you know we were really trying to find our way. And then we broke through as a regular part of the sports fans rotation. And then we became this runaway hit. Um, to be part of that um, was probably the honor of my career. Um, and I had a blast doing it. Now I will say at the end, I had to get out of there. Because what when and I love Stephen A too, but when when it was Stephen A and Skip for two straight hours and that's all it was and they were yelling at each other and I'm in the middle. <laughs> about two years into that, I just remember thinking, "What in the hell am I doing? Like, th th I can't do this much longer." The, the, the Tim Tebow topic five times in two hours, you know, yeah. knowing exactly what Skip was going to say. <laughs> Um, it just became way too much for me. And at the time, Sports Center had an opening at the same day part. You know, I was doing 10 to noon on first take. At, at the time where I was really at the end of my rope, um, John Buchagross was going from the 11 a.m. Sports Center to the 11 p.m. And they had come to me and said, how would you like to take John's spot? And I go, I, I would love to. First of all, it felt like a, a life raft for me. I was going to have, you know, I just, if you do any job long enough, it, it feels like you're stamping fenders, you know, and I felt like that with first take. And now I had a chance to go to the sports center division and do something completely different and have a different producer, a different director, a different crew and different co-host. I jumped at that opportunity. 
and was really glad that I did because I don't know that I would have signed my last contract. I know I wouldn't have if I was still on first take. I, I would not have because at that point, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard. I had to do something different. Is is there an element to skip of, of like what what he does is in act? Is there theatrics behind it? Is is he is he trying to cause a, a rise out of sports fans, or is it all really genuine? Yes, no, somewhere in the middle. And here's what I mean by that: Skip is certainly a showman. He knows how to deliver his opinion with drama and flair. So does Stephen A. But Skip was absolutely married to his opinion. You were never going to bump Skip off a topic, ever. You were never going to talk him into the fact that Tiger Woods was the all-time greatest golfer. No, he wasn't in his Skip's mind, and he was going to tell you why every time we discussed him. You were never going to tell him that LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan. You, you won't. He f absolutely passionately believes everything he brings to the screen. Now, I do think the genius part of Skip was he knew which topics to be the dis voice of dissension on. He always shot at the guys that most people put up as heroes. Everybody, There was LeBron James idolatry going on in this country. Their, Tiger Woods' worship was off the charts. When T.O. was you know, the greatest receiver we had seen since Jerry Rice, he was going to come on and tell you why you were wrong. No, LeBron is not better than Jordan. He doesn't have the clutch gene. He's never, you know, six for six for Jordan. You know, LeBron has a losing record in the finals. All of the same old arguments, but he absolutely fervently and passionately believes all of that. So he just has a real interesting knack of taking the guys that most sports fans hold up as great and he's telling us why they might be great, but they're not as great as you're making them out to be. And he did it as well as anybody. And he never backed down from his opinions. He damn near went to his grave telling us that Tim Tebow was the next uh, Tom Brady, you know? And it was a really weird run in our show when we became all about Tim Tebow. And our coordinating producer at the time just put his teeth into that and said, we're going to talk about Tim Tebow every 20 minutes. So get used to it. And we did. And it drove me right over the edge. I'm like this, this guy, I liked him personally. Um, but I'm like, this is a, a weird phenomenon. He'll go nine for 25 for 93 yards yet win. Like what, what, what's, how is this happening? And he was winning in really bizarre and weird, almost divine intervention kind of ways. And, you know, there was Skip to tell us why everybody was wrong and that Tim Tebow was great. Now, ultimately, Tim's career flamed out, and long-term, Skip was colossally wrong on that. But if you bring up Tim Tebow to Skip today, he'll tell you he never got the fair shake that he needed, and if given a chance long-term, he'd have five Super Bowl. You know, I mean, he believes that stuff. So, you know, and he never would change his mind in a meeting where Stephen A might, might be on the fence on something, and we don't bring topics to the table where they both are on the same side. So Stephen A would say, yeah, I can take the other side of that, no problem. Mm. And he can, and, and make it seem like that's where he is. Yeah. And I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that he is you know, making up uh, points of view just so we have points of dissension, but he was good enough to do that. Skip right, would never go on TV. Yeah, there is a skill to that. He, should, he could have been a great defense attorney yeah. uh, because he's a great orator, he can, he can, he's very convincing and compelling with his argument. I don't think Skip could go on TV for one second and try to make a convincing argument of something that he himself, deep down inside, doesn't absolutely believe. Um, you, you mentioned Woody Page, who obviously is a, a big part of what Cold Pizza was and the, the start of First Take. And I, I, um, that reminded me of there's a story that I saw that Woody has, has told that. He said he and Skip Bayless got into a, a literal physical fight because off camera because Skip was was bragging about having more sex than Woody in his life. So did were did you happen to be around for that exchange? Oh, yeah. and is it uh, is it true? Yeah, there are parts of it that are true. 
Um, the part that <laughs> I had a coworker, a mutual coworker that sent me a script only. It was a text version. I didn't see him telling this story. I yeah. just saw the text version of it. Um, and there was a lot of embellishment in that, but that's the beauty of Woody. Woody is a storyteller. Woody is the guy in the room that commands an audience wherever he goes. He loves to hold court. And when he has an audience, he knows how to keep them. Um, he's just, you know, Woody is one of the truly most giving people I've ever known. Um, and I, when I say giving, I mean, he hates to see anybody suffer. Uh, when there was a terrible hurricane in New Orleans, when we were working together, Woody owned a place in Florida somewhere. And he reached out to organizations to find out how he could open his residence in Florida to a family from New Orleans that had been displaced from the hurricane and was in great need. He found a single mother with a couple of kids and no help and moved them into his Florida residence and didn't do it for, nobody even knew about this. He didn't publicize it. He only told his closest friends about it, but that's Woody Page. He is just a kind, caring, giving person. On the actual story where they came to blows and I think it said they ended up outside the studio on the New York City streets, like <laughs> that's not exactly how it happened. But I still got a big kick out of reading it being there and watching it firsthand because what happened in the meeting, it just randomly came up. Skip somehow leans back in his chair and he said, I've had more sex than everybody in this room. And we were all looking at him like, first of all, what kind of thing is that to say? You know, like I said, we're not in junior high. Um, <laughs> secondly, apropos of nothing we were talking about, um, Woody may have been, you know, bragging about a conquest or something and Skip just shoots him down by saying, you have no idea. And so from that point, it comes up on the air, which stunned me. But Woody would do that. Woody would take the thing that should have been left in the meeting room and bring it to TV. Sometimes it was gold. Sometimes it wasn't. But in this particular case, somehow it got brought up on. And I'm just sitting there between them going, what are we going to do now? And the way I remember it, and it's been years, um, the way I remember it, they sort of came together like in a jostling for the cameras kind of way. Like, you know, just sort of, you know, grabbing each other. And, and, and then Woody had this thing that he always used to do where he would trip on purpose on camera for a response. Um, he would just, he was, you know, he was really good at drawing attention to himself. And I think what Woody did for the cameras as we were going to commercial break was he tried to make it seem like it was more than what it was. But we went to commercial break and then it got not serious, but they were kind of tussling. But it didn't go outside the studio, outside the green room, right. outside the our, our uh, Manhattan offices into the streets of New York. Like it was nothing even close to that. But his version was pretty entertaining. Yeah, still still quite the story. But I still um, love the guy. How how about the the blueberry muffin story? Are you are you aware of of that? That's something that Skip had spent a lot of time on earlier uh, this year on his podcast. Apparently, during an early episode of of First Take, Stephen A. Smith complained that there were were no blueberry muffins at a <laughs> at a road show. Um, we were in then, Miami for the NBA yeah, Finals. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were we were in Miami for the NBA Finals, and he was a new regular addition to the show, even though he had worked as a rotationary fill-in for Woody Page in the past. Um, all of the back and forth that allegedly happened, according to Skip, between Skip and Stephen A, were that was between them, and I was not privy to any of that. Um, yes, I was in the morning meeting. Yes, there was always constantly discussion about what was available for eating. Woody... Um, I believe it was, you know, I hope I get this right. I think Woody kind of used to roll his eyes at Skip's dietary needs for some of the, it was kind of diva-ish stuff, you know, that I never even really cared about or got involved. I didn't care. If I wanted something to eat for breakfast, I would stop and get it at a Starbucks and bring it myself. Right. Um, I just, I don't know if what a part of that story is true, but here's the beauty of Skip. Skip tells that story on his podcast and he has all of us on the edge of our seat for 30 minutes. 
And if you really think about it, it's such a trivial, mundane thing. And I know Skip was trying to tell that story to sort of make a point. Like yeah. Stephen A came in and wanted diva treatment. I never saw that. I, I just didn't. I mean, he can be very difficult at times, Stephen A. Just, I think he's sometimes he's kind of moody and some of the staff would kind of come in and gauge, is he in a good mood? Can I, can I, can I say this today? So he was a little temperamental that way. Skip stayed to himself. For the most part, Skip was kind of on an island. You know, he would stay in his dressing room and then he would come out for the show and then he would go home. And he never went out with us as a group after the shows or for dinners at night. He just is a, you know, he's just a, a private person that feels more most comfortable when he's working out or watching sports. That's what he, that's what his loves are, and that's it. Um, and I think uh with that whole story, I just, I was, I texted both of them. I'm like, come on guys. Like really? And Stephen A, I think had called me and said, no, we're good. Everything is good. Um, but there was a period in time where, you know, th there were some feathers that are ruffled now with some of the recent developments now where Shannon is now with Stephen A on right. first take. And I just read recently that first takes ratings are up and, um, I don't undisputed. Uh, yeah, undisputed. I'm sorry, Skip. Undisputed's ratings are down. I don't know if that's true. I did read something like that recently. I imagine that there's probably, you know, that that has probably escalated, and I'm not sure that um, that they're as friendly as they always have been. But I one thing I marveled about the two of them was the fact that um, when you get egos and personalities that are that big, usually the egos uh, overtake the relationship. And it never did with those guys. They loved each other like brothers. Really? They had a mutual respect for one another that was I hadn't seen in any of our pairings. We had hundreds of different pairings. We would have the two live stews in. We'd have Rob Parker in. We would have a, this long list of rotating guests to debate Skip. But there was no one with a personality as big as Skip until Stephen A came. And watching up close, I was watching to see is there going to be a relationship and personality problem here? Because now Skip's got his equal is on the set with him. And it was always understood that Skip was the alpha and everybody else was kind of, you know, subordinate to Skip. Um, and Skip was really, he genuinely loves Stephen A and Stephen A genuinely loves him. Their egos never got in the way when they worked together. Now, some things may have happened since that, time where the relationship might be a little different, but those guys, I marveled at how well they got along and that it was real. Um, cause I wasn't sure that it was at first, but the longer I worked with them, the more I realized, man, these guys really respect one another. And I'm surprised that they ever broke up because I thought neither one of them is going to want to do the show without the other. It became like they were a, a pair and that they just have to be together. There's partner equity going on there. And I think ultimately money gets involved. Skip was lured away by Fox um, and our coordinating producer, Jamie, who at the time had left to go to NBC and then ended up at Fox and he's not there anymore, but he pulled Skip along with him. When he came into our show, he made it very clear to everybody, Skip's the star, everybody else bow to Skip. And that was that was a big dynamic change for everybody on the show. And um, I think Skip started listening to Jamie. Just, Jamie would tell him, Skip, you're the star. You should be treated differently. But Skip never demanded different treatment. He never you know, demanded to be treated like a star. How things are at Fox, I have no idea. Yeah. But, you know, Skip deserved all of that. The, the show did revolve around him and his opinions. And, um, you know, we went, once we went all in on that, it was just, it became a show that I wasn't interested in doing anymore, but I can certainly see why it had wide commercial appeal and skips payroll and salary today. He's earned every penny of it. And the same goes for Stephen a with his at ESPN. Those guys move the meter and there's very few guys in our industry that move the meter but they do. Yeah. Their, their current dynamic is, is super interesting. Like Stephen A loves to, to make it out to be this, this rivalry. Um, but he does, he always prefaces it by stating how much love and respect he has for skip. Um, yeah. 
Were, did, and it's did, real. Did it seem like did other people like working with them? Because like I also think after after the Skip and Shannon relationship started to deteriorate earlier this year, there were there were a lot of kind of narratives out there that nobody wants to work with Skip. And everybody seemed more interested in in going to first take and, and working with Stephen A. At least while while you were there, did other people enjoy being on the show with them? Yeah, I don't think anybody. Now I remember Jalen Rose had a, a problem with Skip, and then ultimately Skip with Jalen over the pistol Pete water pistol Pete uh, comment. You know, this was at toward the end, and and at this point, I had already decided that my days here have got to be short or I'm going to quit the business. Like I've got to find something else within ESPN. So I was already there and I knew it was just a matter of weeks before I went to sports center. But I do remember the show where uh, just in the context of having a conversation, Skip had mentioned to Jalen, what have you won? You know, you and I've won the same number of NBA championships or something along those lines. And I never like it when Skip would do that. And he he did do that with a number of guys. The other guy that I remember he did that with that rubbed the wrong way was Chris Carter. Like, okay. don't tell a Hall of Famer like Chris Carter, you know, you never won anything. Right. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's certain things that you, there's certain things you can't say to an alpha male that has deserved all of our respect. And Chris used to hate it when he would do that. And Chris, and I know Jalen wasn't in love with it. And this particular day when he brought it up, Jalen had had enough. And he just said, Skip, is it true that you averaged 1.2 points a game your senior year in high school? Or maybe it was 2.1. I can't remember. And Skip was thunderstruck. And I was thunderstruck. I was just like, what's happening here? And Skip said, yeah. Yeah, it is. But there's a reason for that. And so he started going into this story about how the coach's son also was the point guard. And, you know, the, I mean, here we are now. now. We're discussing in front of a very large audience Skip Bayless' senior year in high school. Like, yeah. I knew that that was only going to end poorly. I knew it. And so then he said, you know, you know, your, your idol was Pistol Pete. Well, you're water Pistol Pete. And you could hear the voices in the control room go, oh, 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 oh. And everybody in the studio got quiet and I was in the middle of it. And I tried to graciously get us out of it and get us to a commercial break. But when we got there, it was ice in the studio. Like it was not a good scene. And um, we came to work the next day. I had some conversations with Jalen after the show. I had some conversations with Skip after the show. I'm trying to be the peacemaker. And I thought we were in a good place. And then I found out that this thing was about to go to a whole new level. I came in the next morning and I'd mentioned Jamie, who was our CP at the time. Yeah. And it had just recently taken over the show. He loved Skip. He was all in on Skip. He's at the morning meeting and he tells us, so we're going to start the show today with an uninterrupted monologue from Skip. <laughs> I'm not making this up explaining why he only averaged, you know, 2.1 points a game in, in high school. And Jalen was there, you know, Jalen was going to be there and we were going to, and I, I said immediately, we're not doing this. Like, there's no way we're going to do this. And I was told, Oh no, we're doing this. This is so important to skip that we don't know if he's going to do the show today. If we don't do this. So, I look, I understand Skip wanted to defend what was now his record as a, you know, I'm sure he never thought he'd be in a position to do that. And here's Jalen, a guy who, you know, was part of the Fat Five, you know, had a nice professional career. And he's involved with this show now where one of the hosts is going to explain why he only averaged 1.2 <laughs> points a game. It just was, it got out of control. I've never talked to Skip about it. I don't know how he feels about it today. He doesn't change his mind, so he's probably just as adamant that that was the right thing to do in that moment. But then came word that Skip was never, uh, Jalen was never allowed to do another first take ever again. Like it was, you know, he was a banned guest. He was banished. And at that time, Skip had that kind of power on first take because, again, the show was taken to heights we had never reached. And Skip was the guy that took us there. No question about it. 
And so I don't know that Skip ever gave that edict. It was just what producers on the show were telling me. Jalen's right. been on the show for the last time. Um, obviously, Jalen's ro- uh, role at ESPN would only get bigger over time. You know, he ended up being part of the NBA coverage yeah. and all of that. And it, for a time, he had a very big role at ESPN. So, but but I do know that the relationship between Skip and Jalen was fractured. But I, in general, I, I got to say, Skip is one of the most likable guys in real life that you would ever want to meet. He's soft-spoken. He's thoughtful. He's considerate. He cares about his coworkers and friends. Every year, I knew I was going to get a shipment of something to my house for Christmas. Um, he never let me down. He always came through with something. Um, and in general, I think that Skip is well-liked by his coworkers. That was my experience with him. I never... Uh, had an ill word with Skip during our nine years plus together. And you would think that when you work that closely with someone for that long, at some point... Now, I I was getting a little tired of the Tim Tebow show, and that was, you know, all a product of Skip. And ultimately, that's why I said I had to get out. But, like, I never resented Skip for that. It never affected our personal relationship. And again, the Skip Bayless you see on TV is completely different from Skip Bayless in real life. Quiet, kind, thoughtful, considerate, a, a good guy, a really good guy. Yeah, it certainly it does, doesn't always come across on on television. But I think um, you know, to to Skip's credit, he almost he he doesn't necessarily care about uh, about what what people think about he him. He doesn't, and, and, and no. he certainly he presents himself a certain way on TV, and and he's comfortable with that. Um, how, how was being part of the Rocky Balboa movie? That was fun. Um, it was different. You know, I still hear from people every once in a while. I was like, Holy cow. I just saw you in Rocky Balboa. I had no idea. Um, it was cool. They came in. I think we shot everything in a day, maybe two. They came in and they used our studio and they just set up their film cameras and they had us reading prepared lines. It was a kind of a canned debate. And the whole debate was, you know, can Rocky Balboa come out of retirement and win the title? Right. And um, it was really cool that Sylvester decided to use that show yeah. as the jumping off point for him coming back. Like, I think it was Skip that was like, this guy's over the hill. He can't fight. And then he sees that and he's like, I'm coming back, you know? <laughs> so that was kind of cool to be a part of one of the more successful movie series really in American cinema history, even though it was just a very small part, it was really cool. Did, did it bother you at all that you didn't get a chance in, uh, in draft day being that that was a Cleveland based <laughs> movie and that, that role kind of went to Tony Rizzo instead. How did that happen? I mean, how in the world did that happen? No, you know, there are, um, things that happen with movie companies that own, uh, entertainment divisions or yeah. news divisions. And they always, it's always, they're always looking to promote, one of their own. And I know that the Rocky series wasn't Disney. It wasn't a Disney property, but it was just Sylvester. Cause we had asked some of the producers, like, how did we get picked? He's like, Sylvester likes the show. And he wanted right. to incorporate this into his new movie. Um, I don't know how these things happen. I don't know who makes these decisions. They just called, asked if we'd be interested in doing it. They paid us handsomely and we still get a check every three months from SAG AFTRA on a royalties check. And I'm like, wow, I, I, you know, all these years later, they're still paying me every three months for a movie that I was in for maybe a minute, a minute and a half. Right. It's crazy how that works, but yeah. it was fun. I'm glad to say I had an opportunity to do it. And, um, you know, it's kind of cool that y- this is a movie series that's iconic and uh, it's going to be around forever. So, yeah, that was really fun. Jay, you were awesome. Thank you uh, so much for joining the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon. No problem. Um, by the way, treat uh, one of your new colleagues. I don't yeah, know ben, if you even Ben heard. Axelrod. Yep. Ben is a champion, man. I yep. love Ben. His desk was just a few from mine in the WKYC newsroom. Yep. We hated like hell that we lost him. Um, but uh, he's he is a great guy. He's yeah, very cool, good cool at his addition. job. Great addition for you guys. He's uh, just a super good guy, and I'm. I'm glad and proud to be able to call him a friend of mine. Yeah, I'm definitely happy to have him here. 
Um, that is Jay Crawford. I'm Brandon Contis. This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Please rate and subscribe to this podcast. Please also subscribe to Awful Announcing's YouTube page. But regardless of how you consume Awful Announcing and the Awful Announcing Podcast, thanks for listening and be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing. <laughs>